On a Puritan and Reformed audio podcast, I'm reading from a small section of the book, The Christian and Complete Armor, by the Puritan William Gurnall. Doctrine, the Christian's life is a continual wrestling. He is, as Jeremiah said of himself, born a man of strife, or what the prophet said to Asa may be said to every Christian, from hence thou shalt have wars, from thy spiritual birth to thy natural death. From the hour when you first set your face to heaven, you shall set your foot in heaven. Israel's march out of Egypt was, in gospel sense, are taken the field against sin and Satan. And when had they peace, not till they lodged their colors in Canaan. No condition wherein the Christian is here below is quiet. Is it prosperity or adversity? Here is work for both hands to keep pride and security down in the one faith and patience up in the other. No place which the Christian can call privileged ground. Lot and Sodom wrestled with the wicked inhabitants thereof, his righteous soul being vexed with their unclean conversation. And how fierce he is, O are! Do not his own daughters bring a spark of Sodom's fire into his own bed in which he is inflamed with lust? Some have thought if they were but in such a family, under such a ministry, out of such occasions, oh, then they should never be tempted as now they are. I confess change of air is a great help to weak nature, and these forenamed as vantage ground against Satan. But do you think to fly from Satan's presence this way? No, though you should take the wings of the morning, he would fly after you. These may make him change his method in tempting, but not lay down his design. So long as his old friend is alive within, he will be knocking at your door without. No duty can be performed without wrestling. The Christian needs his sword as much as his trowel. He wrestles with a body of flesh. And this, to the Christian in duty, is as a beast to the traveler. He cannot go his journey without it, and as much ado to go with it. If the flesh be kept high and lusty, then it is wanton and will not obey. If low, then it is weak and soon tires. Thus the Christian rids but little ground, because he must go his weak body's pace. He wrestles with a body of sin as well as of flesh. This mutters and murmurs when the soul has taken up any duty. Sometimes it keeps the Christian from duty so that he cannot do what he would. As Paul said, I would have come once again, but Satan hindered me. I would have prayed, made the Christian say, at such a time, and meditated on the word I heard, the mercies I received at another time, but this enemy hindered. It is true indeed, grace sways the scepter in such a soul, yet a schoolboy's taken their time and their master is abroad to shut him out, and for a while lord it in misrule. Though they are whipped for it afterwards, thus the unregenerate part takes advantage when grace is not on its watch to disturb its government and shut it out from duty. Though this at last makes the soul more severe and mortifying, yet it costs some scuffle before it can recover its throne. And when it cannot shut from duty, yet then is the Christian woefully yoked with it in duty. It cannot do what it doth as it would. Many a letter in his copy does this enemy spoil while he jogs him with impertinent thoughts. When the Christian is praying, then Satan and the flesh are uprating. He cries, and they louder, to put him out or drown his cry. Thus we see the Christian is assailed on every side by his enemy. And how can it be other when the seeds of war are laid deep in the natures of both, which can never be rooted up till the devil cease to be a devil? sin to be sin, and the saint to be a saint. Though wolves may snarl at one another, yet soon are quiet again, because the quarrel is not in their nature. But the wolf and the lamb can never be made friends. Sin will lust against grace, and grace draw upon sin whenever they meet. A reproof to such as are not true wrestlers first. This may reprove such as wrestle, but against whom? Against God, and not against sin and Satan. These are bold men indeed who dare try a fall with the Almighty, yet such there are, and a woe is pronounced against them. Woe unto him that striveth with his Maker. Isaiah 45, 9 
It is easy to tell which of these will be worsted. What can he do but break his shins that dashes him against a rock? A goodly battle there is like to be when thorns contest with fire and stubble with flame. But where live those giants that dare enter the list with the great God? What are their names that we may know them and brand them for creatures above all other unworthy to live? Take heed, O thou who askest, that the wretched man whom thou seemest so to defy be not found in thy own clothes itself. Judas was a traitor, though he would not answer to his name, but put it off with a master, is it I? And so may you be the fighter against God, the hardest deceitful. Even holy David, for all his anger, was so hot against a rich man that took away the poor man's ewe lamb that he bound it with an oath that the man should not live who had done it. Yet proves at last to be himself the man, as the prophet told him, Second Samuel 12. Now there are two ways in which men wrestle against God. First, when they wrestle against his spirit, and two, when they wrestle against his providence. First, when they wrestle against his spirit. We read of the spirit striving with the creature. My spirit shall not always strive with man. Genesis 6.3 Where the striving is not in anger and wrath to destroy them, that God could do without any stir or scuffle, but a loving strife and contest with a man. The old world was running with such a career headlong into their ruin that he sends his spirit to interpose. And by his counsels and reproofs, to offer, as it were, to stop them and reclaim them, as if one seeing another ready to offer violence on himself should strive to get the knife out of his hand with which he would do the mischief, or one that hath the purse of gold in his hand to give should follow another by all manner of entreaties, striving with him to accept and take it. Such a kind of strife is this of the spirits with men. They are the lusts of men whose bloody instruments of death, with which sinners are mischieving themselves, that the Holy Spirit strives by his sweet counsels and entreaties to get out of our hands. They are Christ's grace and eternal life that he strives to make us accept at the hands of God's mercy, and for repulsing the Spirit thus striving with them, sinners are justly counted fighters against God. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Acts 7.51 Now there is a twofold striving of the Spirit, and so of our wrestling against it. Number one, the Spirit strives in his messengers with sinners. They come in on his errand, and not their own. He vouches the faithful counsels, reproofs, and exhortations which they give as his own act. What Noah that preacher of righteousness said to the old world is called the preaching of the spirit first peter three nineteen the pains that moses aaron and other servants of god took in instructing israel is called the instruction of the spirit nehemiah nine twenty so that when the word which god's ministers bring in his name is rejected the faithful counsels they give are thrown at sinners heels and made light of then do they strive with the spirit and wrestle against christ as really as if he had visibly in his own person, had been in the pulpit, and preached the same sermon to them. When God comes to reckon with sinners, it will prove so. Then God will rub up your memories and mind you of his striving with you and your unkind resisting him. They, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Now men soon forget whom and what they hear. Ask them what was pressed upon their consciences in such a sermon they have forgot. What were the precious truths laid out in another, and they are lost. And well were it for them, if their memories were no better in another world, it would ease their torments more than a little. But then they shall know they had a prophet among them, and what a price they had with them in their hands, though it was in fool's keeping. They shall know what he was and what he said, though a thousand years passed as fresh as if it were done but last night. The more zealous and compassionate, the more painful and powerful he was in his place, the greater shall their sin be found to break from such holy violence offered to do them good. Surely God will have something for the sweat, ye lives of his servants which were worn out in striving with such rebellious ones. Maybe yet, sinners, your firmament is clear, no cloud to be seen that portends a storm. But know as you used to say, winter does not rot in the clouds, you shall have it at last. Every threatening which your faithful ministers have denounced against you out of the word of God is bound to make good. 
Number two, the spirit strives with man more immediately when he makes his inward approaches to the consciences of men, debating in their own bosoms the case with them. One while he shows them their sins and their bloody colors, and where they will surely bring them, if not looked to timely, which he does so convincingly that the creature smells sometimes a very fire and brimstone about him, and is at present in a temporary hell. Another while he falls a parley in entreating with them, making gracious overtures to the sinner, if he will return at his reproof, presents the grace of the gospel, and opens a door of hope for his recovery. Yea, falls a wooing and beseeching of him to throw down his rebellious arms and come to Christ for life, whose heart is in a present disposition to receive and embrace the first motion the returning sinner makes for mercy. Now when the Spirit of God follows the sinner from place to place, and time to time, suggesting such motions and renewing his old suit, and the creature shall fling out of the Spirit's hands, thus striving with him, the thing being unaccomplished, as far from renouncing his lusts or taking any liking to Christ as ever, this is to resist the spirit to his face, and it carries so much malignity in it, that even where it has not been final, poor humble souls have been so overset with the horror of it, that they could not for a long time be persuaded, but that it was the unpardonable sin. Take heed, therefore, sinners, how you use the spirit when he comes knocking at the door of your hearts. Open it as knock, and he will be your guest." you shall have a sweet company. Repulse him, and you have not a promise he will knock again. And if once he leaves striving with thee, unhappy man, thou art lost forever. Thou liest like a ship cast up by the waves upon some high rock, where the tide will never come to fetch it off. Thou mayest come to the word, converse with other ordinances, but in vain. It is the spirit in them which is both tide and wind to set the soul afloat and carry it on, or else it lies like a ship on dry ground which doesn't stir. We wrestle against God when we wrestle against his providence, and that two ways, when we are discontented with his provincial disposal of us. God's carving for us does not please us so, but that we are objecting against his dealings towards us, at least muttering something with the fool in our hearts which God hears as lightly as man, our words. God counts in, we begin to quarrel with him, when we do not acquiesce in and say amen to his providence, whatever it is. He calls it a contending with the Almighty, Job 11.2, yea, a reproving of God. And he is a bold man, sure, that dare find fault with God, an article against heaven. God challenges him, whoever he is that does this, to answer it at his peril. He that reproves God, let him answer it. It was high time for Job to have done, when he hears what a sense God puts upon those unwary words which drop from him in the anguish of his spirit, and paroxysm of his sufferings. Contend with the Almighty? Reprove God? Good man, how blank he is, and cries out, I am vile, what shall I answer thee? I will lay my hand upon my mouth. Let God but pardon what is past, and he shall hear such language no more. O oh, sirs, take heed of this wrestling above all other. Contention is uncomfortable with whomever it is we fall out. Neighbors or friends, wife or husband, children or servants. But worst of all with God. If God cannot please you, but your heart rises against him, what hopes are there of your pleasing him who will take nothing kindly from that man who is angry with him? And how can love to God be preserved in a discontented heart that is always muttering against him? Love cannot think any evil of God, nor endure to hear any speak evil of him. But it must take God's part, as Jonathan's David's, when Saul spake basely of him, and when it cannot be heard, will like him arise and be gone. When afflicted love can allow thee to groan, but not to grumble, if thou wilt ease thy encumbered spirit into God's bosom by prayer, and humbly wrestle with God on your knees, love is for you, and will help you to the best arguments you can use to God. But if you will vent your distempered passions and show a mutinous spirit against God, this stabs it to the heart. We wrestle against providence when incorrigible under the various dispensations of God toward us. Providence has a voice if we had an ear. Mercy should draw, afflictions drive. Now when neither fair means nor foul do us good, but we are impenitent under both, this is to wrestle against God with both hands. 
Either of these have their peculiar aggravations. One is against love and so disingenuous. The other is against the smart of its rod and therein we slight his anger and are cruel to ourselves and kick in against the pricks. Mercy should make us ashamed, wrath afraid to sin. He that is not ashamed has not the spirit of a man. He that is not afraid when smitten is worse than the beast who stands in awe of whip and spur. Sometimes mercy, especially these outward mercies, which have a pleasing relish to the carnal part in a Christian, has proved a snare to the best of men. But then affliction uses to recover them. But when affliction makes men worse, and they harden themselves against God to sin more and more while the rod is on them, what is like to reclaim them? Few are made better by prosperity, whom afflictions make worse. He that will sin, though he goes in pain, will much more if that once be gone. But take heed of this contesting with God. There is nothing got by scuffling with God, but blows are worse. If he say he will afflict thee no more, it is even the worst he can say. It is as much as if he should say he will be in your debt till another world, and there pay thee altogether. But if he means you mercy, you shall hear from him in some sharper affliction than ever. He has wedges that can writhe thee, were you a more naughty piece than you are. Are there yet the treasures of wickedness and the scant measures that is abominable, saith God to Israel? What? Incorrigible, the Lord's voice cries unto the city, bidding you hear the rod in him that has appointed it? See what course God resolves on. Therefore will I make thee sick and smiting of thee. As if he had said, My other medicine I see was too weak, it did not work or turn your stomach, but I will prepare a potion that shall make you sick at heart. Second, it reproves those who seem to wrestle against sin, but not according to the word of command that Christ gives.